Hello, and God bless you, brothers and sisters. My name is Reverend Jared Reed Smith, and I'm a minister here at the Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church, where my pastor is, Dr. Johnny Calvin Smith. God bless you, brothers and sisters, and thank you for joining me for our Sunday school lesson. Now, of course, we are the Mount Moriah Church, and we are his work in progress, and we want you to be a part of our worship experience. Now, we start and we've opened up our doors for in-person Sunday school. Uh, please join us Sunday morning for Sunday school at 10 a.m. Of course, we continue to share this as a way of evangelism uh, to the world. And so we will continue to share this lesson. Uh, but if you are ever in the DFW, DFW area and would love to join us, 10 a.m. for Sunday school, and then 11 o'clock for morning worship. Wednesday night, Finding Time with God. That is our adult Bible series. Our pastor is taking us through the Bible and we'd love for you to join us. There is a Zoom link in the description of this video where you can join us live Wednesday at 7 p.m. or you can join us via our live stream on YouTube. Please be our guest and grow with us in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. I believe that is all of our announcements. As always, uh, if you'd like to be a blessing to the Mount Moriah Church, there is a link in the description of this video where you can give according to that which God has put on your heart. Before we get started with our lesson, let's pray. Gracious God, we do say thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for uh, this lesson. Thank you for everything that you're doing in and among us. Lord, we just bow in humble submission to who you are. Thank you, God, uh, just for just everything that you uh, continue to do in, uh, in us and through us and for us. Thank you, God, just for everything. Bless your word like on you can. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, our lesson for this week comes from Mark, the gospel according to Mark, Mark chapter 1 verses 4 through 13. Our lesson topic is Jesus' baptism. Now, of course, Mark's gospel portrays Jesus as the servant of the Lord sent to accomplish a very specific work for God. According to Mark chapter 10, verse 45, this book uh, does not contain any references to the birth or childhood of Jesus or even that of John the Baptist. It begins very abruptly, as it were, and we'll look at the very uh, chapter one, verse one. It says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, as it is written in the prophets. Behold, I send my messenger before the face, which shall prepare the thy way before thee. Uh, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So the book goes straight into uh, that of the ministry of John, meaning John the Baptist, this prophesied uh, messenger who would prepare the way for the Lord. John, as we uh, would believe, would be about 30 years old at this time. And, and Jesus was about the same age since Jesus, since John was rather, John was only six months older than Jesus, according to the gospel, according to Luke chapter one, verse 36. And this is where our lesson is going to begin after Mark uh, introduces John the Baptist as that voice crying out into the wilderness. Give, allow me to give you that brief outline, verses 4 through 8, the preparer, verses 9 through 13, the prepared. Verse 4 says, John did baptize, meaning John the Baptist, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of of sin. So Mark tells us that John, John the Baptist, uh, did baptize in the wilderness. Now, which we learned elsewhere was uh, the wilderness or the desert era of area of Judea. And you can see that in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. According to Acts chapter 19, verse 4, it says that John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, meaning Jesus Christ. John always pointed uh, his followers and those that were around him to Jesus Christ. See, those who submitted to this baptism of repentance bore witness that they had turned from sin and were ready for the Messiah. John preached uh, that the, those who repented would receive the remission of sins. This remission would mean uh, the removal of sins. And, and it refers to uh, that in essence, the remission of sin means the counseling of the sin. Now we know ultimately Jesus came 
uh, to do away or forgive for the forgiveness of sin. And matter of fact, he says, uh, here comes the Lamb of God. John says it. He sees Jesus coming afar off and he taketh away the sin of the world. Verse five says, and there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sin. So in other words, in response to John's ministry, a large number of people, uh, mainly Israelites, of course, openly confessed their sins and received the baptism of repentance. And they were aware of their personal sin and admitted to their failure uh, to keep that of what God would want them to do. Verse six says, and John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of a skin about his loins. And he did eat locusts and wild honey. So he lived on a very, how can you say, he didn't live the fancy type of life. He lived on a diet of locusts and wild honey. Uh, you would think about that as grasshoppers. Uh, according to the law in Leviticus chapter 11, locusts were acceptable uh, for eating and they were often used for those that were uh, maybe poor. So honey, of course, was available uh, because of the wild bees in the area. So therefore, John lived a very simple life. Uh, he didn't represent any type of religious or political party. Uh, he was all about a very simple livelihood and he was always trying to do the will of God. Verse seven says, and preach saying, there cometh one mightier than me. Now this is John. His, his, he always pointed others to Christ. He says, there cometh one mightier than I after me, uh, the latcheth of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. Do you see uh, in comparison to himself, he saw himself to be lower Brothers and sisters, that should always be our response. He says, I'm not even worthy uh, to, to tie his shoes. Uh, imagine, oh, help us, Holy Spirit. Oh, imagine if the real believers, believers in Jesus Christ would carry that type of understanding of who the Lord is and who we are. Uh, and, and so much so that we realize that we're not even worthy uh, to, to latch his shoes. He thought of himself of taking on the, the 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 form of even a slave. He says, I'm not even worthy to be his slave. I'm not worthy. So in comparison to what I'm doing, uh, I understand that I'm not even worthy to even tie up uh, the Lord's shoes. Imagine if we had that same type of understanding, the humility. That'll help us in our service. That'll help us in our walk. That'll help us in our dealings with other people. I thought I'd brought, bring that out. Verse eight says, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So John was administering what we know to be an outward symbol that identified this person to be a repentant and willing person to submit to the Messiah. See, John, John understood, and as we should, understand that the water baptism is an outward symbol. The water doesn't save us. I told the young people uh, in preparation for this coming week's lesson that said we're going to talk about Jesus' baptism. So I kind of took a, a, a just a view of what everyone thought about it. I was very proud of the young people that were in attendance on last Sunday because I told them, where does the water come from? They said, from the faucet. And I said, yeah, you can, you can, you know, this is just water. Water doesn't save us. It is a symbolic way in which we show, and it is something that the Lord would want us to do. It's, it is an ordinance, right? It is what we should be doing as an because Jesus gives us the example. And, and what we come to understand is that the water does not save me because what, what saves me is my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my personal savior. You know, we, we got to make sure that we're not adding uh, anything to it. Now, a person that has been saved should want to carry out with this ordinance of the church, that this should be one that would want to be baptized. But we know sometimes there are situations that happen in our life uh, where we can't be baptized. Uh, I'm not going to get into them over there, but just think about it logically. A person that has truly accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior, but unfortunately is not able to physically be baptized uh, as in the example given today, that person still is saved. It's just that they're not able 
to go through with this ordinance, this, this, this water baptism. So, but he understood that I, I baptize you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. See, Jesus' baptism with the Holy Ghost would transform the heart and the true identity of the believer with God's spirit. Water was the medium uh, Jesus used to, or John used to identify those that have repented uh, with and, and war, those that were awaiting the Messiah. Uh, but he says, but the Messiah would identify believers with himself by bestowing upon them the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Uh, and of course, this had not come uh, yet. It had not yet been given even when Jesus was about to return to heaven. But he promised that in many days hence uh, that they were uh, to be patient and be waiting uh, for this, this comforter. He says, and then, of course, we know that this happened on the day of Pentecost as even Peter later confirmed in Acts chapter 11, verse nine. Now we look specifically at the baptism of Jesus and it says, and it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in, in Jordan or in Jordan. So uh, it came to pass, meaning that sometime during this ministry, and we would know that this would be the beginning of his ministry, Jesus did come from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, this account doesn't say anything about the reasons for Jesus's baptism. His baptism was not a baptism signifying repentance because Jesus had nothing to repent of because he had not committed any type of sin and never did commit a sin. However, from other scriptures, we learn this rationale or this reason for Jesus's baptism. Several reasons have been suggested. First, Jesus, uh, it, it was necessary. He says to fulfill all righteousness, according to Matthew chapter three. Now, this probably meant that he had to be baptized to, to, to demonstrate obedience uh, to his father's will. Second, we see a reason for it is in Jesus's baptism, Jesus identified himself with sinners. Uh, he would soon take their sins on the cross, uh, symbolically, as it were, uh, for the remission of their sins. So that's just a few reasons uh, that we come to understand why Jesus was to be baptized. Verse 10 says, and straightway coming out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. So Mark's emphasis, brothers and sisters, was not so much on Jesus's baptism itself uh, as on it was the signs and the testimonies that accompanied it. It says, so straightway, indicating that uh, these testimonies or signs happened just immediately after Jesus had come up from the water. Uh, this sign of the testimonies, this sign came and he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descended upon him. So this spirit descended upon Jesus from the open heavens in the form of a dove. This was visible anointing, as it were, or evidence to John that Jesus was the one in which he was a promise. This is that he was the one who would baptize with the spirit, according to John chapter one, verse 32. I want to read that one for you. John chapter one, John chapter one, as I turn in my Bible, John chapter one, and John bear record saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him and I knew him not but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I saw and bear record that this is the son of God. So no doubt John, who received specific instructions from God, uh, this was a sign for him and fulfillment that he gave testimony in John chapter one, that the one that after you have baptized him, that you would see the spirit coming down uh, as it were as a dove, uh, like a dove, that would be the one uh, that would that you're preparing the way for. And so John bear record that now I understood at that time uh, that this was Jesus Christ. This was the son of God. And so it was, you know, I, I laughed one time. It wasn't none of that cousin stuff. Oh, I understand now that you are the son of God, even though from a human standpoint, they were cousins. But no, this was a clear symbol 
that this was the son of God, the one that he had been preparing for. Verse 11, verse 11 says, and there came a voice from heaven saying, uh, thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So this is another testimony that came from God the Father. God's words reaffirmed to Jesus that he uh, that he is now going to begin his ministry that would lead him into the his horrible, uh, humiliating yet humbling experience in dying for all sinners. Uh, the Father still did love him because he says, "In whom I am well pleased." I know what you have to do. This is something that had been planned in eternity past, but I want you to know that I'm well pleased. And so the father was vindicating and he's verifying and validating uh, that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Verse 12 says, and immediately the spirit drives him into the wilderness. Here Mark tells us uh, that immediately or just as soon as Jesus was baptized and the father spoke, that the spirit driveth him into the wilderness to be tempted uh, by Satan as we shall see in the next verse. And so the fact that it was immediately gives us the understanding that Jesus uh, was definitely obedient in everything that he was doing. It's interesting though, that the one that led him uh, into the wilderness to be tempted was the spirit. I thought I'd just drive that out. Now, I don't I don't have anything else to say as a result of that, but I think that that's pretty uh, noteworthy to note that uh, this was always in accordance. Everything was very strategic. It was very intentional in the way uh, that Jesus, because uh, Jesus was being driven to be tempted of Satan. And even in verse 13, it says, and he was there. Uh, notice how Mark uh, in, in brevity does not give us the account of, of the temptation. Uh, notice he he skips all of that. He just helps us to know he sum, summarizes what was a very, uh, very awe-inspiring event in the beginning of Jesus's ministry. He summarizes it in verse 13. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered uh, unto him. So Mark's account of Jesus' temptation, as I said previously, was very brief. It does not contain any details uh, not like those of uh, Matthew and Luke. Uh, however, and if you do want to see the background, Matthew chapter four and then Luke chapter four, Mark simply says that he was in the wilderness and he was tempted of Satan. He didn't, he did not, uh, he did not, uh, of course, we know that he did not sin. Satan tried to tempt him on those accounts, but we do know that Jesus uh, was always in the will of the Father, and he was always one with the Father. And in his oneness, he did not sin. Uh, and in no ways he uses the he used the word of God to combat uh, that of uh, the devil's temptation. So Mark also wrote uh, that while he was there, he was in the wild. He was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Mark's account is the only one uh, that actually includes that he was in there with the wild beasts. I think that would just show uh, and suggest uh, that Jesus was very human. Uh, he was very one that was among people. It was his, uh, it, it wants you to understand that Jesus, uh, in, in his way, he, he, he was one that was one with man. You would understand that uh, Jesus, who is the creator in its essence, is the creator of the whole world, yet was with among wild beasts. He, in his humanity, uh, Jesus was one that was in touch with mankind, uh, even in the sense that he was among the wild beasts. And then it says, and the angels ministered unto him. God's angels were, uh, as it were, supplying and supporting Jesus, as it were, uh, attending to him. Uh, and so uh, that is the actually the end of our lesson for today. And we definitely do thank God. In Jesus's ministry, we are now introduced to this public proclamation of who Jesus is. And we do thank God uh, for what he did for us. And as we go through these lessons, we just pray and prayerfully uh, consider uh, as we even look forward to that of the Easter season, a resurrection a Sunday heading towards that. Let's just be reflective on what Jesus did for us. He who had no sin, who knew no sin, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So let's just be grateful. Let's be thankful 
for all of what Jesus did in, in his humanity, in his love and kindness. God sent God and Jesus in his humanity, uh, in his person, the person of God, God the Father. He sent Jesus Christ to come and be among lowly men, lowly men, he who created the heavens and the earth, because he's one with the Father. He, he, so he came down uh, to be born, uh, uh, born of a virgin and, and went about doing nothing but good, always being one with the people. And of course, that led him to the cross of Calvary. But because of that, uh, we have salvation. God bless you, brothers and sisters. May God keep you from the Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church family.